Hello, my name is Michael Dambert, and uh, today I want to talk a little bit about some of my own personal experiences in, uh, in business, uh, particularly in, my, in the early days. Uh, I started uh, 50 years ago, I suppose, back in the 70s. And uh, I want to do this because I think sometimes, um, w w you, you, you know, personal experiences can give you a, a, a better insight into what is actually happening and how we've got where we are, as opposed to to uh, reading books and listening to lectures and, uh, and, and mulling over statistics and, and, and listening to politicians telling you everything is quite different from what it actually is. Before I do that, I, I, I would just like to thank everybody who's um, who's commented on my last video and who bought my book. And I'd like to um, ask if, if if you wouldn't mind if you if you haven't already subscribed, I'd be very grateful if you would do so. Or if you know somebody you think might be interested in what I have to say, I, I'd be very grateful if you pass on my details. So I started out my first business uh, back in the early 70s, and it involved uh, going to Italy with a car or a van and uh, and finding lots of uh, artisans, lots of these small workshops and buying goods, giftware and knickknackery and so on, bringing it back to the UK and then driving around selling it to various gift shops all over the country. Now in those days it wasn't so easy to go to Italy and not that many people went there and uh, it was you know, the journey was more difficult, there weren't so many motorways and so on and it was... Um, it took a long time, and uh, uh, even simple things like making a phone call. I mean, believe it or not, when I when I very first started, if you wanted to make a telephone call to 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 Italy, you had to ring the GPO, which was state owned, uh, and you had to book a phone call for the next day, and they'd ring you back and say, "Oh, we're trying to put you through now," and that was the only way you could phone anybody in Italy. But uh, the thing about Italy was that everywhere you went, there were artisans. There were just so many artisans. You could be in a mountain village somewhere, you could be in the middle of the middle of Milan and there were artisans working on metal and wood and glass and leather and marble and all, all these sort of things. Lots of them making these sort of ornaments and giftware. So given that weren't many, there weren't many people going there and given that there was so much available and so on and the prices were very good, it was a, it, it was a great opportunity. And uh, I, I, I got uh, really stuck into this business. I think the first time we went to uh, we went to Italy, went in a car and bought a bootload of stuff. Next time I went in a van, then a bigger van, a bigger van still. And eventually we ended up with a, a 32-ton lorry and we were sending that to Italy and back a couple of times a year and filling it up with, with, with all the stuff. I was supplying all the department stores, you know, bins, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Debenhams and House of Fraser and uh, Harrods and Selfridges and all the catalogue companies and so on. I, I had a nice, 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 nice business there going really well. Now, I always wanted to... Uh, to buy stuff in the UK. I thought I can get stuff made in the, in the UK because a lot of the things I was buying in Italy, I was, we were designing ourselves and getting them to make it for us. And I thought it would be really good to, to try and get stuff in, in, made in the UK. And uh, just to give you an example, I remember one, one instance in, in particular where I, I, I wanted to get some lamp bases made. They were made of wood, turned wood. And I knew that there were people doing that sort of work in, in, in we were in Lancashire, not far from where we were. So I made an appointment to go and see a firm to see if they could make these uh, lamp bases for me. And I remember I turned up, it was a small, small business. They had about 20 employees and it was in a rather rundown old building. But uh, outside the front door of this, this, this building were, were two parking spaces. One was for the uh, managing director and the other was for the uh, finance director. And in these parking spaces were two brand new shiny Lancia cars. And so uh, I went into the, I went into the, uh, through the front door into this little foyer place and knocked on the glass window and, and the receptionist opened the door and said, oh, you come, have you got an appointment and all the rest of it? And just a minute, I'll see if Mr. So-and-so is free. And then you, uh, I mean, this is an experience I've heard so many times, you were expected to wait at least 15 or 20 minutes to, you know, to make the point that the person you were seeing was more important than you were. And I looked around the room and those certificates were membership of the CBI and membership of the local Chamber of Commerce and all this stuff and uh, so on. Uh, and uh, in due course, I was shown through to this, this, this guy I'd come to see and he was sat at a great big desk in a big leather armchair. So I said to him, you know, I've, I, I want to make these land bases. Could you, could you make them? And I, mean, I knew he could make them. And, and uh, so he uh, he had a look and uh, he, he did what I've an experience I had so many times afterwards. He then started on a whole list of reasons why it would be difficult. And it was this question of, is it, is it got to be that shape? Um, well, yes. 
Well, we'd have to, you see, we'd have to adjust our machines to, it'd be difficult. How many do you want? Hold a sample. Mm. Uh, and I want it in pink. <sighs> Couldn't do it in pink. We've got some blue paint, or we've got, I think we've got some yellow. We could blue, would blue or yellow do? No, no, I want it in pink. That'd be difficult. I mean, if you place an order with us for, for, for a few thousand, then we can get the pink paint in, but otherwise it's difficult. And how soon can you make a sample? <sighs> Very busy at the moment, very busy. Oh, at least three weeks, might be a bit longer. Uh, why don't you give me a ring in a couple of weeks' time and, and I'll t tell you whether or not we can fit you in. And I had that experience over and over and over again. This attitude of the customer is really just a damn nuisance. You know, they obviously had some work and they were quite busy and, uh, and that was enough. And so you you know you just in the end I mean I, I in, in that case I just sort of walk away saying I would never ever in a million years deal with that firm and uh, uh, and the same happened with so many other firms. Nowadays I'm sure everything's changed because now you've got Trustpilot and if you if you mess customers around then you 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 soon get a, a, a bad uh, notice or two and you, and you you soon end up in trouble. A week or two later, I was in Italy. I thought, well, I'll just have to buy the Blanc bases in Italy. And I was somewhere in a, a, um, a, one of the valleys up behind a, a town called Brescia, where they do a lot of wood and so on. Drove around. And I just went into a, a, into, a, into a firm. There was no office, no reception, no nothing. I just walked straight into the to the, the mill where all these guys were working away at the, 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 the benches. It was a similar sort of size to the firm I'd, I'd encountered in Lancashire. And uh, I, I went up to one of the guys and said, you know, Where's the boss? And he said, "Oh, it's that guy over there." And he, there he was, all covered in sawdust, working away on his on his on his lathe. And I said to him, "You know, I want to make this lamp base. He's here, fine." And I said, "I want it painted in pink. Yeah, no problem. Just tell me which shade pink you want." And uh, and I said, "Oh, how long would they have a sample? Well, yeah, come back tomorrow if you like." And it was just so much easier. And and, and although occasionally uh, dealing with Italians was a bit shambolic, it was almost always always fine. And and and. Uh, and everything worked, and they were quite sensible. And, and, and but they had this sense of of wanting to serve the customer, which, which just didn't seem to exist in the UK. In my experience. So anyway, I used to go to these trade fairs in Milan, where all these artisans used to have stands. There'd be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them in a great big uh, uh, exhibition complex in in the middle of Milan. And you'd go around and see all these uh, all these stands, and they were all nicely done up and all nicely presented and everything. Everything was quite smart, and you'd find a lot of stuff there. And on one occasion, I was looking for some little glass ornaments, which I'd seen previously in Venice, and I thought there was something I could sell. So I went around and I found one or two glass companies, and I asked them if they could make it and so on. They couldn't. And, and, and uh, But the price was very high, and I thought, I can't I can't really sell that. It's too, it's too expensive. And so I thought, well, forget it. Now, I'd finished going around this fair, and uh, when I noticed, or I thought I'd finished, but I noticed at the top of one of the halls, there was a little tiny hall. It was no more than a big room, really, um, which wasn't really very well signposted. And to get to it, you had to go up some stairs or up a, up a rickety old lift and so on. And so I went up there, and I went into this, 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 this big room, and uh, there were about 20 small stalls there. No customers and just uh, exhibitors just sit around talking and everyone was scruffy. There were no signs, none of the stands. I mean, it was just a mess. But it was the Chinese section. It was the Chinese delegation. So I went around and I walked around and, uh, and I came to a, a stand where there was a girl sat behind a, a, a table and she had all these glass ornaments on, on the table. And so I, I, I started talking to her and I said, could you make what I was wanting? She said, oh, I think I've already got it. She went to the corner, there was these, all these scruffy um, uh, little cardboard boxes and she opened them up and everything was wrapped in newspaper and she pulled it all out and eventually she produced just what I wanted beautiful quality absolutely perfect and I asked I asked the price and I think it was certainly less than half the price that the Venetians had been had been asking and that was my first encounter really with Chinese suppliers and uh, it wasn't long after that. It was a combination of that that incident and and, and realizing suddenly there's a source somewhere else that's cheaper and where people are are, are able to supply um, the same quality at a much better price, and uh, and indeed I did order from that particular firm and uh, and the goods arrived on time and there was no problem whatsoever. And I'd also noticed that more of more and more of my buyers, particularly department store buyers and so on, were, were turning up at these trade fairs in Milan and so on. So I thought it's time I'm going to have to find an alternative source of supply anyway. So I started going to, to, to first Hong Kong and, uh, and then to China. 
And uh, the first time I went to China, I remember it very well. I went to a city called Guangzhou, a huge city. Um, when I went there, it was about 1982, 83, I suppose, and it was just the beginning when they were beginning to open up a, a, a little bit uh, and to, to free enterprise. I remember the thing that struck me above all was how silent everywhere was because you know, people talking very quietly, everyone's on bicycles, there were almost no private cars. There were a few buses, but they were so old, they were so beaten up, just falling to pieces. The roads were all pockmarked. You know, the buildings were all run down. Everything was run down. The hotel I stayed in was extremely shabby. There was no air conditioning in. It's quite a, it's quite a hot, humid part of the world, that. And uh, 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 the same city, 30, 40 years later, is now one of the biggest, richest cities in the world. I mean, it's just a staggeringly rich city, just full of glass towers and... Uh, palaces and boulevards and gardens. It's got a metro of 300 stations, all absolutely sparkling. Everything is just phenomenally rich and, and, and successful now. But uh, that, 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 that uh, was very much the opposite when I, when I was there. And I went to the trade fair and I found all these, uh, you know, the trade fair complex was all very scruffy again and uh, very amateurish and so on. But everybody was very helpful. And whenever you bought anything, you know, it came on time, and it was exactly as you'd ordered, and it was the price was ever right, and there was never any, there were never any problems. And I think this has been the key to the Chinese success. I mean, this is the the, the, the lesson they 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 started out with, which is what every business should know, is that there is one paramount priority for any business, and that is keep the customer happy. If your customer buys from you and you supply on time, the right price, the right quality, they'll come back. Whereas if you're going to mess them about or waste their time or change the price or the quality is not right, that's it. You're not going to do any business. And this is this is as far as I can see, is is the way that that China has taken you know, has become the manufacturer of the whole world. Now, at about that time, I used to go to also to the factories in China, and and this was also a very interesting experience, especially in such an early stage of this opening up. And uh, I mean, you've heard the expression "dark satanic mills." I mean, these really were were you know horrible buildings. I mean, I, I remember one in particular was a huge building, an enormous building, about five stories high. And on every level, the, the, the floor was just these long, long tables with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these little girls. They're all girls, all teenagers who'd come from all over China, from the countries and the poor parts and come to work and earn a bit of money and to send it back home and so on. And uh, they, they were living in dormitories, which were next to the, the factory. And uh, I'm I mean, being told this, that the factories were running on 24 hours a, a day and they'd have three eight-hour shifts. The girls would work six days a week. And uh, three girls would say would, would share a bed. So, so one girl would be sleeping and one would be working and the other one would be eating or washing her clothes or whatever. And then they'd rotate. And so they really suffered these girls. They were earning hardly any money as well. And, and, and in a sense, I know what people are thinking now, you should, you should just have turned away and said, I'm not going to buy from these, these, these sweatshops and so on. But 30 years later, I mean, these girls aren't in those factories anymore. They're all, they're, or their children are at rate. I mean, they're all middle class now. They're all living in other cities all over China where they've got these, you know, these masses of big new apartment blocks and they've got their... Uh, huge shopping centres and they can buy anything that we can buy here and all the, the Western brands are all in these shopping centres and so on and they live a completely different life now. And uh, much of what they were doing has been automated and of course uh, what hasn't is now moving to other countries, you know, the next on on the next rung of the ladder, you know, for the Indonesia and the Philippines and, uh, and uh, uh, Vietnam and so on. And, and, and I suppose so it goes on. But... Uh, I, uh, from then on, carried on with this this, this, this business, and it, it, it worked very well. It was very successful. And it was quite, quite profitable for a very long time until until Mrs. Thatcher's uh, recession in the eighties, and then uh, uh, this decision that the government seemed to make to to uh, let all our manufacturing go and to, for us to become a a uh, service based economy, and for the city of London to be the the World Centre for Finance and so on, which was, of course, a great success, and it did work. But it seemed about that time that we decided that what manufacturing we had got, we could just let it go, and we could uh, we could just buy a ring from the Chinese because it was cheap and, 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 and reliable and easy. And I used to, you know, I, when I used to go to China, and I'd, uh, I'd see all these people working so hard, and uh, it was all so tough, and they were all so disciplined and so determined and so ambitious, and... 
so helpful. And I'd come back here and I'd see, it was that time when everybody was shopping, obsessed with shopping, and I'm, I'm, a lot of people are still are. But you'd see, uh, you'd see people, particularly on Saturdays, all going to the shopping centres and buying clothes they didn't need, and people getting used to having two or three holidays a year and going out to eat and, uh, and, and all the things. Just take it easy, really, and, and having a, 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 a quite a good time. And uh, probably very often getting into debt, and the nation was getting into debt, we began to get into debt then, and so on. And it, it seemed very obvious at the time that this this couldn't last, that, that sooner or later there'd only have to be some sort of disruption and everything could be thrown into all sorts of... Uh, all sorts of chaos and uh, so anyway you can the I, I carried on my business the the economy carried on I think uh, limped along and uh, until we got to to the financial crisis in 2008 and uh, that was a, obviously a, a huge shock and I think it was the, the time when we realized that we hadn't got any uh, much manufacturing left and it was a time when I think the decision should then have been made to go for, for, for high tech, to go for IT and to go for all these high wage, high skill jobs that they're now talking about, which, uh, which, 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 we're, which we're too late now to uh, you know, create our Silicon Valley. I think back in 2008, if that had been the policy, if the government had decided to borrow and invest in all these industries, we'd have had a fair chance. But we didn't. We went for austerity instead, and austerity meant that people were poor and people didn't have so much money to spend. Businesses didn't do so well, and so on. And generally, we went in this period of of gentle, slow decline and and, and, and mounting debt, and uh, punctuated, of course, by the uh, London 2012, which was a great success, and I think it, it, it showed the world or gave the world the impression that we were very successful and uh, and, and, and doing really well. But as we went, uh, as as things got worse, going into the uh, uh, you know the, the, from 2008 onwards to, to, to 2016 when we started to realise that things weren't going quite so well and we didn't have quite so much money to spend we had to find someone to blame for it and we did what has happened so much in, in history so many times before we decided to blame foreigners and so what we started saying was it's the EU if we hadn't joined the EU everything would be so much better Remember, we joined the EU, uh, we were the sick man of Europe. We really were a basket case. Uh, and throughout the time, we, we were members of the EU, uh, we, we did better and better. And, uh, and uh, the idea that somehow, by leaving and, and, and being on our own, we'd be better off was, was so, so ridiculous. But, of course, a lot of people fell for it. A lot of people looked around and they said, well, we're not as well, we, we haven't got as much money as we used to have, and so on. And... Things aren't that good, so uh, yes, it must be. There must be a reason. Yes, it must be the EU. Let's let's let, let's all leave. And we voted to leave, and uh, we all know what happened. <clears throat> and now, a few years on, and uh, a year or so after we've actually actually finally left, we can see. I mean, no one but a complete fool can see that it's an absolute utter disaster. And so it's time to find uh, someone else to to blame because there's a lot of anger about. If you look at the state of the economy, there's a lot of lot of anger anger with the government and so on and so the government has to try and find a way of focusing this anger somewhere and uh, so they've come up with a number one priority and uh, you know Sunak who who is frankly pretty pathetic I mean he's just a he's just he's just a bookkeeper he's a manager isn't he? he's not a, he's not a leader and he's being pushed around by 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 various uh, groups of his backbenchers uh, I mean seeing him in, in Prime Minister's questions on, on, on Wednesday seeing uh, Dominic Raab the Justice Secretary sat beside him Bold as brass, Justice Secretary. He's been investigated for eight alleged instances of bullying. And he sat next to the Prime Minister as if nothing was happening. Of course, I, said, but I, I presume that, that, that Sunak can't sack him, like he can't sack Braverman. But anyway, uh, he, he comes to uh, the Commons for Prime Minister's questions. Otherwise, he seldom comes. But he came last week for a special announcement, a special announcement, because we have to focus all this anger. When you look around and you see the state of the economy and you see how, how, how prices are going up, how everybody's really concerned, interest rates going up, mortgages are going to go up, and you see all the strikes, you know, nurses for the first time ever, more and more strikes coming. So you've got to focus all this, on, uh, all this anger somewhere. Uh, and they found something, and it's, it is what has been announced by Sunak and by others as the government's number one priority. 
above everything else, the one, one most important thing for this nation at the moment is to stop people coming across the channel in little boats. They're the ones we must focus our, our, our anger at. These terrible people. They're coming here, escaping wherever, coming here, taking our jobs. These people, a lot of them very highly qualified, particularly the Syrians, doctors and all sorts uh, amongst these people. But nonetheless, people are prepared to do almost anything. We, we are desperately short of workers, but now we put them in concentration hotels, don't we, instead. And they're the people we must, we must focus on. We must really, really learn to hate these people. Except, except when they drown. And then, as the politicians say, Sunak said it himself, Braverman said it, they all say it, then they pray for them. They pray for them and their families when they drown. The rest of the time, got to get rid of them. And I think it's this, this, it, it, it's, it's, this, this, it's a question of attitude, really, isn't it? It's a question of a, a sort of national, national uh, mentality, really, at any given time. And I think, I think I sense here at the moment. I mean, everybody's pretty desperate. Everybody's worried. Nobody knows where we're going. There's one thing which is absolutely, absolutely certain: is that we are destined to decline. We, the, the ship is sinking, because we've cut ourselves off from the uh, the biggest, richest, and most successful market in in, in the world. Uh, we've got to find other markets elsewhere. We we've. Uh, opted to to leave whereby we're behind uh, uh, almost impenetrable barriers certainly impenetrable for, for for any small or medium-sized company so that whole market which was which which we relied upon so much for all the time that we were members is now is, is gone it's gone and so we were looking around and they keep telling us about we've got all these new trade deals we haven't we rolled over a few that we had in the uh, whilst we we're in the eu and we've got a couple of lousy deals with australia and new zealand i mean we haven't and there's nobody else is going to give us any any significant any significant uh, 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 trade deals and, and any talk about uh, high wage, high growth and uh, um, high tech and Silicon Valley and levelling up. It's just hogwash. It's just hogwash. And sadly, I think the, the opposition are just as bad. I mean, I think they're, they're set on making a success of, uh, of the sinking ship and, and, and you cannot make a success of a sinking ship. And so uh, it's all very depressing. I mean, there are lots of people, people who, who, who are... Um, who favoured Brexit, who are talking about we must move on now. This is the situation, we must move on. Well, yeah, we've got to move on. But uh, uh, the only way we're ever going to ever going to solve our problems is by closer relationship with Europe. And uh, neither the government nor the opposition seem particularly uh, particularly uh, interested in that. The government, I mean, still hate Europe as much as ever. We've all been told what a terrible lot they were and how... how, how how damaging our membership of the EU was, and so on. And so, anyway, uh, I, 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 I did, uh, you know, thinking back over my fifty years, I was thinking about just how how things have got us into this this mess, and how foolish it was when we were uh, doing reasonably well inside the EU to have, to have left, and how I think we have a. You know this this that instance I gave you about the firm in Lancashire, the, 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 the firm making the wood, and and sort of. Being more important, the customers treating customers as a bit of an in, uh, a bit of a nuisance, and I think there's that sense of superiority superiority we have in this country. I think there are lots of people now. People are very living in deprived uh, uh, neighbourhoods who are not doing very well and worried about their jobs and so still believe that we're superior to all these these these, these French and Italians and Germans and Austrians and so on. Because we're somehow we're better. You know, we won the World Cup in 1966, didn't we? And it's very sad, and I—I I, I mean, I don't know what has to happen before we actually have a complete change of, uh, you know, a, 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 before we wake up to reality. But um, but anyway, that's what I what I what I thought about it. Um, if you watched this far, thank you very much indeed. And uh, if I could just be finished by saying, if you haven't already subscribed, or you know of anybody who might be interested in in what I've got to say, I'd be grateful if you'd uh, you do so. And to thank everybody, as always, who, who, who is kind enough to comment on my, uh, on my videos. I do read every one of the comments, even though I don't have time to, to reply. And finally, finally, just to remind you, uh, my book is still available, ml44.com. I'll put a link down below. And thank you to everybody who's, who's bought it already. And so uh, 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 on that, I'll, uh, uh, I'll finish. And if you've watched this far, thank you for watching. And until uh, next time, bye-bye.